My name is Dr. Mark Pennington. I'm a senior lecturer in political economy in the Department of Politics, Queen Mary College, University of London. The question of trust has attracted a good deal of attention recently. It's often noted that people do not trust political institutions and politicians are eager to come up with remedies for this apparent social malaise. In recent years, social scientists have also focused a good deal of attention on the role that trust or social capital as it is often known, plays in supporting the institutions of a liberal democracy. In brief, social capital refers to the willingness of people to trust others and also the willingness of people to adhere to basic norms of conduct, such as truth-telling and the observance of contracts, even in those situations when they may be able to get away with breaking the relevant social rules. Understood in these terms, societies with high levels of trust and social capital tend to perform better than those with lower levels of trust, because in the latter, people have to spend much more time checking up on each other to see whether or not they're being cheated in one way or another. Within this context, analysis is centered on the question of what sort of institutions promote trust and social capital, and which institutions undermine it. Many within the communitarian and social democratic traditions in political thought argue that market processes undermine trust and social capital. While they accept that markets and competition have an important role to play in generating wealth, it is argued that markets need to be kept in their place if the social fabric is to be maintained. According to this view, an excessive focus on self-interest and a follow-the-money mentality in markets undermines norms of solidarity and community spirit, with people increasingly willing to put their own interests above those of the community at large. It is also argued that if social capital is to be sustained, the state must play an active role in supporting and promoting the civil institutions that are thought most likely to generate, are generated, including sports clubs, charities, environmental groups, and possibly even religious associations. In rescuing social capital from social democracy, we challenge the view that markets undermine trust and that the state must intervene in society to promote social capital. On the one hand, we suggest that social democrats and communitarians misunderstand the type of social norms necessary to sustain an advanced cosmopolitan economy. On the other hand, we suggest that state-sponsored attempts to promote trust and social capital are likely to undermine it. In what follows, I offer a brief outline of our arguments in this regard. What sort of behavioural norms are necessary to sustain an advanced liberal democracy? Communitarians and social democrats suggest that social solidarity and a sense of social unity is essential for the maintenance of trust and that markets undermine this solidarity. In a sense, they are right that markets undermine solidarity. The problem is that solidarity and a sense of common identity and purpose, what is often known as bonding social capital, are not compatible with a cosmopolitan society where people come from many different traditions and beliefs. Societies which organize themselves on the basis of solidarity tend to be exclusive. They define themselves in terms of an us versus them attitude. While solidarity may be appropriate to, work, to a world where people share the same beliefs and everyone knows everybody else, it is not appropriate to situations where we may need to cooperate with people who have different attitudes and moral values. If people only trade with people who share the same moral outlook or only trade with locals rather than with foreigners, then the sphere of cooperative relationships will be reduced in favour of a narrow form of nationalism, regionalism, or even at the extreme tribalism. The more we rely on shared moral ends as the basis for cooperation, the less we will be able to cooperate with those who differ in their moral values. The type of norms that are needed to sustain a cosmopolitan society are those that can be subscribed to by different people from many different backgrounds, traditions, and beliefs. These include very basic norms of conduct or bridging social capital, such as a willingness to observe contracts, to, to respect property rights, not to steal or to engage in acts of theft or fraud. Bridging social capital is required to facilitate cooperation without there being social unity. So the question is, can a market economy sustain these bridging social capital type norms? In our view, it can. Far from undermining these basic norms of trust, a market economy tends to reinforce them. Why? Because competition in a market economy is as much about competition for reputation 
as it is about competition in goods and services. In a society in which people have more scope to switch away from producers who show themselves to be untrustworthy and to patronise them, to patronise those who demonstrate a greater willingness to cooperate, there are strong incentives for people to develop and to maintain a reputation for honest dealing. Entrepreneurs in markets often have to strive to create or to build trust where it is absent. Simple devices that we take for granted, such as money-back guarantees or brand names, which develop a reputation for a particular quality of service or professional ethos, are everyday examples of entrepreneurial attempts to build trust and to encourage ongoing rather than one-off relationships. It is because people are so reliant on maintaining their reputation in a competitive environment that they tend to internalise basic norms of cooperation, even in situations where they could escape formal punishment for breaking these kinds of rules. More often than not, it is state intervention in markets which undermines trust. When, for example, governments bail out financial institutions that have engaged in dubious lending practices, they undermine the incentives for agents to develop and, and maintain a reputation for probity. Similarly, when governments maintain an open-ended commitment to keep people on welfare benefits, they may undermine the incentive for people to develop the social skills and reputation necessary to get on in the world of work. This is not to say that markets promote universally trustworthy conduct. There will always be those who engage in scams and crooked deals. The point is that markets do not discourage trustworthy conduct. There is no evidence that markets undermine trust. On the contrary, international comparisons indicate that societies which ha have higher levels of economic freedom, in other words, those that are more market-oriented, tend to exhibit higher levels of trust between people. Similarly, field research from developing countries suggests that people who have the greatest contact with the market economy, in other words, with the external world, rather than being subsistence producers, exhibit a much greater propensity to abide by basic norms of fair dealing. Now you might say that the view that I've expressed so far represents a rather cold view of the world. A world in which relationships are governed entirely by contractual principles. This is not, however, necessarily so. Although a market economy is not based on close-knit norms of solidarity at the macro level, it can sustain many much closer-knit relationships at the micro level, such as those formed in families and to a lesser extent in civil associations such as sports clubs, musical societies and other voluntary groups. At some point in their lives, most people want to find a common cause with others, whether this is associated with the intimacy of family life or the sense of camaraderie that we often get from being a member of a civil association. Even commercial organisations such as firms often attempt to develop a sense of team spirit and group loyalty in order to improve their internal performance and to obtain a competitive, competitive advantage. A market economy then does not prevent people from finding common cause with others or from developing close-knit bonding relationships. What matters, however, is that such bonded relationship based on a common cause operate at a relatively small scale. They cannot be scaled up to the society-wide or governmental level. If we try to develop a common identity or common purpose at the governmental level, far from promoting a spirit of cooperation, we will promote conflict as rival groups compete to control the governmental apparatus in an attempt to impose their own particular set of values or their own particular favoured causes. Why then can't the state promote social capital? There are two reasons that we question this view. First, there is no more reason to believe that the state has the knowledge to promote social capital than it has to promote the development of economic capital. The knowledge of which business ventures to sponsor, to support, cannot be centralised in the political process. On the contrary, it is widely dispersed across hundreds of thousands of different investors and consumers and emerges incrementally from a process of trial and error learning. Similarly, knowledge of which civil associations promote social capital is widely dispersed. Of course, the political process doesn't eliminate trial and error learning entirely, but it does reduce it. The more money the state spends, the less scope there is for the multitude of individuals and groups to experiment in many different ways to create their own associations. If government uses public funds 
taxpayers' money to promote civil associations, it reduces the scope for individuals and groups to support those organisations and people that are most conducive to their ends and which they think are worthy of their trust. Secondly, the higher the proportion of spending that is channeled through the political process, the greater is the likelihood of promoting a culture of conflict rather than voluntary cooperation. When the state spends money, people will spend relatively less of their time trying to, to persuade others to support a particular cause or group on a voluntary basis and will instead spend more try time trying to capture the state apparatus in order to control the flow of funds obtained via compulsory taxation. There is already evidence that the character of civil associations in Britain and in many other countries has changed in this regard. Many non-governmental organisations that were once genuinely voluntary associations which relied on persuasion have transformed into campaign organisations demanding that the state spends more of other people's money to fund their own particular favoured cause. Thirdly, state support distorts the incentives that civil associations face. If groups gain an increasing proportion of their revenue from the state rather than from voluntary contributions, this reduces the level of accountability to their membership. People can no longer register their disapproval of a particular group or its ethos by withdrawing their individual contribution. The only form of accountability left is the much less direct method of lobbying for a reduction in taxes or of voting for a different party at an election that may be several years away. So government intervention reduces the accountability of civil associations and therefore reduces the likelihood that they are going to embody trust reflecting the, the fact that people value the things that they do. To conclude, there are many myths about the market economy. One of the most long-standing of these myths is the view that markets erode trust and social cooperation in favour of a narrow form of selfishness. A further myth is that state intervention can correct for human imperfections. Markets are far from perfect institu institutions, but overall they promote rather than undermine cooperative norms. There are few, if any, reasons to believe that state-sponsored forms of cultural planning aimed at promoting social capital will be any more successful than their industrial equivalents. Thank you very much.